Well, it's Steve White, Steve White's 89. Well, I've finished my gay movie marathon, but um, there's a few documentaries I want to watch. Now, this one is called The Tasty Raid, or The Tasty Raid Reunion, which is the actual second title that, that comes up on the DVD, which isn't on the cover of the um, DVD or anything, or any of the credits or anything. But um, it's a fairly important um, case. It's a landmark case in um, Australian legal history and in the gay um, civil rights movement and um, everything. Um, it's the story of a little club called Tasty, which was in Flinders Lane. It was um, very famous for being very extravagant and um, it was predominantly gay. Well, it wasn't specifically gay. There were straight people who would go there as well, but it was predominantly gay, um, transgender people, drag queens, just anyone who just wanted to get dressed up and put on a show. And um, it, was very, um, it was very extravagant. It had a real reputation for um, the sort of caliber of people who would go there and... Um, it was sort of one of the hot places to go. And as far as I know, because I came to the gay scene after this, this was um, August um, 7th, 1994, when the raid happened. Um, and I think the two sort of big clubs, there was Tasty and Freakazoid, and I didn't get to go to either of them because they were both gone by the time I got to Melbourne. But um, this club, um, it had um, a, a sex on site. I guess they had, had a license. Um, there was a room downstairs called the maze which was i guess the second floor downstairs where they had little rooms and things and it was mostly where people would hang out apparently not that many people would hook up it wasn't like a huge thing but it was something that did happen and like most clubs there was drugs and basically the police decided one night to target this club allegedly supposedly because um it was seen as a gay club and it was called operation maze so clearly they were targeting it for the sex on site um um, adventures of people and so forth and the weird thing was they had been told somehow they were, they were informed somehow or had known there was going to be a raid that night and they told all the patrons who entered that they'd heard there was going to be a raid that night but they all went in, all 463 people because I think they thought of a raid the way that I have seen raids done since which is where a couple of people, a couple of police show up, they just come in and they just go through and they just stop anyone who looks suspicious a bit of a chat, maybe someone gets taken away, you know, to have have a look in their bags or something, and then they're gone 15 minutes later. That's, that's, I've seen a couple of police sort of go through a venue like that a couple of times. It's really not much of an event. This was totally different. This was totally extreme and over the top and outrageous and shocking and traumatizing to everyone who was there. Um, basically around, I don't know, it was somewhere between 12 and 2. I've heard different, um, different, um, times the police showed up they had bullhorns and flashlights and they just came in bursting about 50 of them screaming and yelling and demanding people um to you know stop where they're going and lock the venue not let anyone out and some smart cookie um put on the smoke machine and just covered the place in smoke and it took a few minutes to clear and that gave everyone there time enough to ditch their drugs if they had any not that there was a lot of people with drugs anyway um from what they found apparently uh, there were only two drug charges there, and they were both dropped. Um, so the the suggestion was that this was just a standard, um, you know, raid for drugs. When clearly, allegedly, supposedly, because I don't think Victoria Police actually acknowledged this, it was totally homophobic, totally targeting the gay community, totally targeting this club specifically for its gay clientele. And um, they were totally drunk on power, abusing these gay people. Um, they separated everyone, they separated the men from the women, um, they put people in different areas, um, but they, did, they didn't, it's not like getting taken off to a little room and being, you know, um, searched by someone of the same sex and, you know, it was just people were being forced to take their clothes off, strip naked, bend over, um, there allegedly were cavity searches and people's genitals being touched and people, even if they weren't touched inappropriately, were humiliated in front of other people. There was no privacy um, and people were forced, they didn't, they didn't let people out of the venue for seven hours and people were forced to stand for hours with their hands on their heads, which aches, or standing with their hands up against the walls and there were people who urinated on themselves because they weren't allowed to go to the bathroom. There were people who were allegedly manhandled, assaulted, um, thrown downstairs, someone who resisted, who refused to do it, was thrown, allegedly thrown down um, a flight of stairs. Um, and just the, the aggression and the humiliation and, you know, slurs like faggot apparently were thrown at people. 
It was just a really ugly scene. Um, and most people there were traumatized. Now, I know a bit about this because um, one of my exes, the same one who um, was in a relationship with the cruising killer, um, which is what he's referred to, I probably shouldn't have referred to it as that, but he's never going to watch this video anyway, so it doesn't matter, um, was there, and he, he told me a little bit about it about because it he, he mentioned it, and I asked him a bit, but I didn't ask him a lot about it. I wish I'd asked him more about it. But um, he um, was like all the others. He um, felt violated and um, was strip-searched and um, all of that, and eventually the people were let out. They were basically thrown out on the street one by one, half-naked, um, traumatized with like a white sticker on them um, and eventually there, there was a human rights group who tried to have something done on the base of human rights they failed pretty quickly but then there was another lawyer a guy called Gary Singer who said I'm gonna make this about money I'm gonna make this about conversation and we'll see you know what happens well it turned into a big deal um, they and I'm not quite sure how this went but um, a lot of people didn't want to come forward because they were afraid they'd lose their jobs. It was seen as a, a drugs raid and a gay club raid, and it was seen as a gay club, and people who were there who were straight or people who were there in the closet didn't want to come out, didn't want to be associated with it. But um, they had a few people, and um, one brave lady was just picked out of the pile, and she basically testified on behalf of everyone else, from what I understand, and they decided from her case that everyone, that it was imp improper, it was unnecessary, it was unnecessary force and um, targeting people and just everything wrong. And they awarded her um, over ten thousand um, dollars in compensation, which was more in you know nine ninety four than it is now, um, thirty years later. Um, oh yeah, it's thirty. I just realised it's thirty years since that happened, almost the month. Um, and I think what happened was everyone um, who was there was entitled to the compensation and got it because it cost the police force over six million dollars um, because it would have been legal fees and other things and, as well. And it didn't. It wasn't like paid by the government on their behalf or something. They actually had to find it in their own funding, and it actually came out of their pockets, and they weren't happy about it. So it gave them a bit of a blood nose, and they had to rethink what they did, and they had to write some really clear guidelines about how you approach a raid and what you can and can't do. And it did change everything. It was very important, you know, as far as a legal law case and everything. And it was an important moment in in gay rights. Um, and some people compare it to Stonewall. I'm not sure about that because it wasn't. Stonewall was a raid on a club where the drag queens fought back and, and the police fell back and um, it was a, a shift in the gay civil rights movement where they finally took a stand and started to fight back. This, no one fought back. They were all abused, felt violated and all were rewarded with compensation. That changed the laws. Now, had they fought back and then it would have been, then it would have been turned about them and they would have been made the villains. Um, and it would have been focused on them, you know, um, assaulting police or resisting arrest or something, and, and the fact of what they did would have would have been lost. But because no one really resists, they're all traumatised, um, they had, didn't know what their rights were, they didn't know what was happening, they were all intimidated and scared and, you know, separated from each other and humiliated and all this stuff, and it just worked in a different way. What happened with um, Stonewall is a lot more like what happened um, on Oxford Street where there was a sort of march that was attacked by police and turned into a brawl and um, a riot and that became the city Mardi Gras so it's more like that but the two events are sort of sort of linked together in sort of legend um, and it is sort of a legendary thing now but um, the nice thing about it is most of the people who are there they sort of because they were sort of traumatized together and went through this experience together a lot of them ended up being friends and there's a group of them who still would meet up and and um, for the documentary, they actually had a bunch of them together and they did like a night, they had a, a night out and they had um, a performance where the, you know, performers came in as police and, you know, they like started raiding the dance floor and then the, the, the patrons, you know, fought back and then they won and they were throwing cash around and everything and um, it, it's, it's quite good. And the last part of the documentary is um, over the credits they have, someone wrote a song about it, a dance song, and they have all the people being... Um, singing the words in front of um, different coloured screens just over the credits and you do get a sense of victory and um, celebration that we won something and um, it's nice that these people did come forward, they were brave, they were rewarded and um, they became friends and they were sort of unified in this experience and, and so forth and it's something that 
you know, was good for the community. And a lot of things changed after that. And I came onto the scene after that. This was like right when Priscilla came out. I sort of referred to myself as a post-Priscilla gay because something changed around 994 and sort of the middle of the 90s. And, you know, gay rights just seemed to move forward from that point on. And everyone after that had a much easier time than everyone before that through the 80s and the sort of early and mid-90s the late 90s and the noughties, we had a totally different experience um, before, you know, the apps came out and Grindr came out and changed it all and everything, and then the you-know-what ended everything. Um, now we're sort of post so many things, but um, I'm going to go. Feel free to share, like, comment, subscribe. Let me know what you think. If you're there, feel free to let me know about it. If you just have an opinion on it, let me know. If you haven't seen it, I would see it. It's a good documentary. It's called The Tasty Bust, although in the credits it does call itself The Tasty Bust Reunion because at the end they have that little reunion. But, um, yeah, it's, 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 it's a good documentary. It's a great story. Glad I finally watched it. I've owned it for years and never gotten around to watching it. Even though I sort of knew what happened, I still didn't watch it till now. I'm just so glad I finally did.